Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Hero Movie Podcast, your greatest source for superhero movie discussion in the multiverse. My name is Adam Portress, and I'm joined as always by Joan Kanan. Dear Heidi, I may have the first recorded incident of death by allergies, but I've had a good run. Go on without me. Mm. In loving memory. And of course, Bruce Leslie. I'm a prickly pear. And you take away my podcasts, and what am I? A scientist, author, father, and university professor. <laughs> oh, yeah, and I also have a sweet wizard suit. Oh, you can't discount the wither- wizard suit, man. That's the biggest. <laughs> honestly, that's what that's the biggest get right there. It's just like, does he have a fancy wizard outfit? <laughs> the, secret, the secret is it's all about the hat. Yeah, it, uh, so just all about the hat, less of the beard. Because everyone thinks it's the beard. You say hat. Oh, yeah. It's the hat, man. The beard, you got it or you don't, but the hat, you can buy. <laughs> I'd have to buy. Well, have no, you I, ever found yourself saying, have you ever found yourself saying while you're wearing that, Bruce, Paladin needs food? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, Wizard did, Well, Wizard was one. Wizard needs food. So, yeah, I, I could see that for you, man. Uh, I don't know if you know the music or not, ladies and gentlemen, or if you know how to read on your podcatching device there. We are going all the way back to 2012 and talking about the first Avengers movie, man. They said it couldn't be done. The long, hold, hard road was paved with good intentions. And did those good intentions fly together? I'd say they did because they made 87 billion movies afterwards, including, you know, three other two other Avengers movies and one of those that wasn't an Avengers movie but might as well have been so I think I think we can pretty safely say that they've done a good job so far I would agree with those sentiments so we're but uh change the game this movie did change the game no kidding we'll talk about a little bit of that game change in action and stuff like that uh we thank you guys so much for uh downloading the show man uh we, we we continue to see downloads go up and up each and every month and it's all because of you guys getting out there telling friends and making that stuff happen man and uh we know that you guys like shows like this one where we kind of go back and really uh break down some of the biggest big names out there we we love the small stuff too but the big stuff boy does the big stuff get the numbers <laughs> <laughs> yes it does they're just like oh avengers i love avengers here talk good about avengers i don't know why the person that downloaded had that weird speech impediment <laughs> But we'll go with that. Just, hey, yeah, why are you making the listener dumb? Yeah, it's it's more me. <laughs> Let's be honest. Isn't it strange that really popular movies make for really popular podcasts? Who to thunk it? <laughs> <laughs> it's really stupid. But, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking about Joss Whedon's Avengers from 2012 over here and all that kind of good stuff. And get into it, man. I think there's a lot to go back. And uh, I, I had some revelations with this movie. Uh, maybe not big ones, but enough enough ones that I think that we can definitely talk about. Uh, we I also, got a hot take myself. Ooh, hot takes. Hot, uh, the 10-year-old hot take. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. It's like seven. Hey, I found out that the working title was Group Hug, and now I like it even better. Yeah, that was true. Absolutely. I remember I remember that. That's, man, that, in the internet age, you know? <laughs> Everything <laughs> seems yeah, like yesterday. Group Hug. Uh, but, yeah, so we'll be talking about uh, Avengers today. And, of course, this is also going to launch us into, you know, superhero season already, kids. Because we'll, we'll talk about what we're going to be doing at the end of the show. But, man, oh, man, does it not stop for HMP. If this is your first episode, man, you picked a good time to jump aboard. Because we got a lot of and good we stuff also, in the And we also, we missed a new release comic book movie this past weekend that I went to see with my kids. Which one? What was that? Well, there was a graphic novel called Tibetan Rock Dog that was made into a movie uh, called Rock Dog. And that uh, was somehow a- my kids drew me in to see it. And I saw it. And it's, you know, yeah, it's not bad. I think we may have dodged a bullet because I saw one commercial for that like a week before it came out, and I'm just like, what in the world is this? But that's that's based on a comic, huh? Yeah, uh, Allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> is your biggest problem with it, Bruce, is your biggest problem with the movie that there's not enough Tibet in it? <laughs> kinda, kinda. Could have used my fact, monks. <laughs> the fact that they dropped Tibet from the name, it went from Tibetan rock dog to just rock dog so that they would get a bigger audience in china where it was produced that uh you know that kind of made me think of the ancient one i thought there was just going to be like a uh, like at any point does a, a dog have a guitar uh throughout the movie that's okay. the point of the movie okay i didn't like i saw like, like i literally saw like four seconds of like the end of a commercial and i was just like well i thank god i'm not going to have to go see that <laughs> and then it looks like at some point in the future we may have to watch it on this silly program hey, there's a there's a a character called Fleetwood Yak, and I hate it that I didn't come up with that. <laughs> That's pretty great. Daddy, why are you cursing under your breath so much? Well, they came up with a really good name here, and it wasn't me that did it. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Elliott does how the does voice it, of Fleetwood Yak. How does Yak. it stand up? 
Wow. How does it stand up against WrestleMania? Uh, whoo, that's a tough one. It's always tough trying to compare animation to live action, you know, but uh, I'm going to give it a slight nod for Rock Dog. Mm. You heard it's it no here, Super kids. Buddies, but it'll do. <laughs> Put the, that's, a, that's a poster quote right there, man. No Super Buddies, eh, but it'll do. It'll be fun. Uh, but yeah, uh, now we haven't gotten one in a little while, but I do want to tell people we are one review away from 90 reviews on uh, iTunes there. So, uh, you know, if you haven't done that, man, we'd really appreciate it. Go out in there. It kind of helps this podcast get out to everyone else. And of course, the people that follow us and support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash HMP. Uh, you guys are going to get some stuff pretty soon. I've been working my fingers to the bone over here and I'll be talking about that at the end of the show, but uh, a lot of good stuff coming you guys this way. And, uh, but do want to thank uh, everybody there, especially the uh, super duper executive producer of the, of the month, Jim Beverly. He knows why. All right. So before we get into the show proper, before we get down to it, because I know everybody is on, on, on with bated breath over here going, talk about the Avengers. But first, we have to get to audible.com. Man, Audible is the leading provider of audiobooks on the internet today. Can anyone name, can anyone name a number two? Uh, you I know the number two, but they buy their audio from Audible, yeah. so it's uh, sort of a rigged game. I, I mean, Audible is the provider of audiobooks. Why right would now. you go anywhere else? I mean, it's just like you know, you don't go, you don't go to a middleman to go get that stuff. You go straight to the source, man. That you hook up to the nectar that is Audible. Now, myself, I had myself a download, and you know what? I downloaded myself, kids. Dragon oh, and the Needles. <laughs> Have you listened though? Downloading's only half the battle. Listen, I got a, I, I'm producing five shows a week with Nerd Talk now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do want to give a thanks to all I do the folks out there listening because the uh, audiobook has gotten quite a few downloads. People using those free credits, man. Use those free credits to download Dragon in the Needles. If you're not an Audible member, you go to audible.com, try now, and you get your free copy of Dragon in the Needles if that's what you want. So uh, I want to tell everybody thanks for those who've done it so far, and thanks in advance to those of you who can't wait for this podcast to be over so you can rush to your computer to do yeah. that. Pause it right now and go do it. We'll be here. It's okay. We'll be back whenever you're ready to come back. We'll be here, man. It'll be good to go. But yeah, audible.com slash try now. I did listen to the first couple of minutes. I I, I got to I gotta get like my dog and go for a nice big walk and stuff. But it, <laughs> yeah. it does good. You you like, I, you, dr you drug me in, Leslie. You drug me in with the thing. And I'll be honest with you. You know, this is the dumbest thing in the world, but you know what like impressed me more than anything? And it's nothing that you did. They do it for all of them. But the second I yep. start up the book and it goes, this is audible. I was just like, oh, <laughs> snap. This is real, son. This is yeah, real. Bruce, Bruce got a real book for real, man. So <laughs> audible.com slash try now. 30-day free trial there. If you decide not to keep it, you still get to keep Bruce's book or any other book that you happen to get there. But I think you're going to like it so much that you'll keep on coming back. That's audible.com slash try try now we thank audible for their support of here a movie podcast let's go ahead and get in it gentlemen here is the trailer for marvel's the avengers you were made to be ruled in the end it will be every man for himself What do we do? We get ready. There was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people. So when we needed them, they could fight the battles that we never could. Gentlemen, what are you prepared to do? No offense, but I don't play well with others. Big man in a suit of armor. Take that away, what are you? A uh, genius, billionaire, playboy, philanthropist. <laughs> if we can't protect the Earth, Sure, we'll avenge it. Dr. Banner, 
work is unparalleled, and I'm a huge fan of the way you lose control and turn into an enormous green rage monster. Thanks. All right, that was the trailer for The Avengers. Here's the IMDb plotline. Earth's mightiest heroes must come together and learn to fight as a team if they are to stop the mischievous Loki and his alien army from enslaving humanity. This is directed by Joss Whedon, starring, you know them all, Robert Downey Jr., Chris Evans, Scarlett Johansson, Jeremy Renner, Mark Ruffalo, Chris Hemsworth, Tom Hiddleston, Clark Gregg. You got Samuel L. Jackson in there as well and a whole boatload of other people. Man, oh man, it has been a while since 2012, but my guess is, as our boy Bruce Leslie has a great comic book connection for this one. What do you got for us, Bruce? Well, in 1960, DC Comics launched a comic book series featuring a team of superheroes called the Justice League. Now, impressed by that book's strong sales, Martin Goodman, the owner at the time of uh, Timely Comics, which would later come to be known as Marvel Comics, asked Stan Lee to create a title featuring a similar team of heroes for uh, the soon-to-be-launched Marvel uh, series of comics. Now, much like the Justice League, the Avengers were an assemblage of pre-existing superhero characters created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, and the original lineup featured Ant-Man, Wasp, Iron Man, Hulk, and Thor. And they united to take down Loki with a little help from Rick Jones. And if Rick Jones is your favorite character, you, <laughs> sir, are a real gem. <laughs> now, when issue four hit, that was the piece de resistance, as they like to say in uh, French-speaking Canada. It was in this issue that a frozen, anachronistic hero named Captain America was added to the team. Now, in the Human Torch story titled Captain America in Marvel Comics Strange Tales number 114, cover date November 1963, which uh, some people may be interested to know, I do have a copy of hanging on my wall. Well, in that issue, Stan Lee and uh, Jack Kirby depicted uh, the brash young Johnny Storm uh, in an exhibition performance with Captain America described as a legendary World War II and 1950s superhero who was returned after many years of retirement. Now, the story ends with this Captain America being revealed as an imposter. Turns out it was actually a villain named the Acrobat, who, uh, as the name would imply, was a former circus performer. And uh, he broke out. Uh, he broke two thieves out of jail and was trying to distract the police while they robbed a local bank. Now, because of the popularity of this issue, they decided to go in whole hog and really bring back Cap. So what happens is uh, Storm, uh, Johnny Storm digs out an old comic book that depicts Captain America. It shows him to be Steve Rogers. A caption in the final panel says that this story was a test to see if the readers would like him to return. And uh, eventually what happened? The Avengers found Steve Rogers' body in the North Atlantic, frozen in a block of ice. And the block began to melt after Namor the Submariner became enraged that an Inuit tribe was worshipping uh, a god other than him. So he threw it into the ocean, uh, mainly because Namor's ego is just that fragile. <laughs> now, Steve Rogers eventually accepts membership in the Avengers and quickly assumes leadership because much like James Brown, he ain't no sideman. Now, in the 1970s, the Avengers stepped up their game and got involved in the got involved in the Kree Scroll War territory previously reserved for the Fantastic Four. They also battled the Squadron Supreme, giving us a close approximation to the Avengers versus Justice League of America. And you may not know this, but in the 1970s, Harlan Ellison actually plotted the Avengers. And you know Harlan Ellison of the Flying Nun fame, because yes, he actually wrote scripts for the Flying Nun. And I say, hey, everybody's got bills to pay. And besides, this guy was as crazy as a soup sandwich. Now, speaking of crazy... Hank Pym had a mental breakdown, and Tony Stark battled a demon in a bottle, and the Avengers had some turnover in membership, and boy, did they get some real jewels. According to Comic Vine, there have been at least 222 members of the Avengers. This includes some real humdingers like a guy named 3D Man. There was also a flying horse. There was Captain Citrus, who I assume is high in vitamin C. Dr. Druid, because what better attribute can you look in, look for in a doctor than the ability to talk to bears? Haywire was a guy that could shoot wires from his fingers, and I guess it could have been worse. He could have shot hay. Moira Brandon was an old lady with no discernible superpowers. Speedball got a stint on the team. So did Squirrel Girl. Stingray. Stingray was even an early part of the team, and all Stingray is is a guy in a scuba suit. And he was part of the team that had access to Namor. 
you know, the team said, you know what we could use? A guy in a scuba suit. Give him a seat next to the God of Thunder and that indestructible android that can phase through walls. Yeah, scuba guy. He'll pick up their slack. That's right. Give him two gun kids, old seat. I guess what I'm trying to say is that if you have any hacky talent and an unstable personality, you too could be a part of Earth's Mightiest Heroes. So you're telling me there's a chance. <laughs> there's a chance. <laughs> That's all we need. The, 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 I always knew I was reading a bad Avengers when Jack of Hearts was in it. <laughs> yep. The uh, the Jack of Hearts who uh, temporarily killed the beloved Scott Lang. We all can't be perfect. But <laughs> so uh, now back in 2012, man, uh, we we were we were treading on un. Uh, unknown grounds here at this point, man. We had ourselves an Iron Man movie. We had a Thor movie. We had a Captain America movie and an Incredible Hulk movie. All Captain America was the last one leading up into this man, and um, we, 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 we. I think we all got what we were del- we were promised all the way back in you know the original Iron Man, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I think. I mean, Marvel Studios really had uh, some ambition here, and the fact that they dared to uh, pull this off is amazing to me. Uh, the whole development of it, you know, started like seven years, I guess, before this came out. It started before even the first Iron Man came out. They knew they wanted to make an Avengers movie, and they borrowed money from Merrill Lynch, which sounds more like the way that uh, some tech industry gets its startup than uh, the Avengers movie. And it's, it's so. Go ahead. So l- l- let me ask this question to you guys: What is your number on this movie? How many times have you seen this movie? Uh, you go first, Adam. I got to think about it. I, I am too. Uh, at least six, maybe more. It, I'd say the bare minimum number is six, probably more than that. I'd say my minimum number is twenty, and there's a potential for it to be much higher than that. Mm. When I watched this movie today, it was the tenth time I've seen it. Oh. Yeah, so I think that's uh, a little bit of an endorsement. I think we're showing our hands a little bit here. I hate. Well, no, I hate watch to this. Just I like <laughs> I scream at it the entire time, and I'm just like, screw you, Joss Whedon, you ruined my childhood. It's like, what did that have to do with your childhood? Never you mind. Uh, so <laughs> I, I can't find my Crow City of Angels DVD. I guess I'll just have to throw in the Avengers. Again. Hey, don't get the Crow people after us again. They already. Anytime we bring up the Crow, that brings up the ire of it. Like most dudes in their forties, just go these these so and sos. How dare you? How dare you besmirch the name of my Crow? Yeah, they've smoked so many clove cigarettes. Good luck, gentlemen. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Crow is much better than Jai Courtney. Well. The, it you know <laughs> that's another group of angry fans. Hey man, I'll, yeah, well, yeah. The, the the people in Australia, for those of you that don't know, the people, somebody from Australia did contact us. And it was just like, hey man, Jack Courtney's really good. You just need to shut your face about him. <laughs> We're like, jeez, dude. <laughs> like we, you know, it's half joking, but we did praise him a lot in Suicide Squad. So, but there is yeah, a contention. I love Cap- Captain Boomerang was great. There's a contention of Australia people that are just like, no, bro, he's really good. Trust me. <laughs> Like okay, that's pal. a good Australian accent. I, you know, we all liked him in Suicide Squad. Yeah. No one said anything bad. It was the first thing I'd seen him in ever, where I was like, "Hey, that, that, he's good in that." The guy's really, really good. No, I, I wholeheartedly agree. But man, with this, you, like you said, Bruce, this thing had been kind of in development for quite some time. The question was who was going to direct it, and of course, a lot of people went back to the the guy who launched off the Marvel universe and said, "Hey, man, John Favreau ought to be the guy that gets this," which would have been a fine enough choice. But when they said, hey, Joss Whedon looks like he's going to direct this, well, Joss Whedon has quite the long history of not only nerdy stuff, writing for actual comic books as well as television and movies, right? Uh, Yeah. But also has a great, great track record of balancing large casts. I think that was, to me, that was the big thing that made me go, this guy's probably a good Helmer because I think that he can uh, juggle all those balls in the air at the same time and still have everybody doing something. Because the problem is, is when you get like eight people on a team, all of a sudden, you know, if you're not careful, one, you know, a couple people are going to be left off to the corner and a couple people are going to be just, you know, taking the whole show. But yeah. this this movie does, and Joss Whedon, I, I, I'll have to give him the biggest credit for this really just kind of kept everything in flux as best as it possibly could. And I, I think he really is uh, the, the arbiter for really getting that in there and thus also bringing it on to the further films with the Russo brothers as well. I think he was and a giant influence I think, on that. I think he deserves 
the the lion's share of the credit for how well this movie uh, turned out, I guess. And and you know uh, you hear some of the stories. You don't know if they're apocryphal or if they're true. But but the story is you know Zach Penn, the guy that wrote the Incredible Hulk, mm -hmm. wrote the uh, original script for this. And when Whedon got that script, uh, he allegedly told Kevin Feige that uh, the studio didn't have anything and they should pretend this draft never happened. And uh, started, you know, pretty much from scratch, though Penn still gets uh, a credit as one of the writers. Right. So essentially what that means, just to give you guys a little behind the scenes stuff. So when you're watching movies, you get this, right? So you'll see the, uh, you know, written by, right? And you'll have Zach Penn's name. And underneath that, you'll have an and. And underneath that is Joss Whedon's name. So in that case, you got Zach Penn having the sole, you know, being the original screenwriter, okay? And then the yeah. letters A-N-D, not an ampersand, but A-N-D, that also means that the next person who's underneath that then came along and rewrote the stuff. Now, they didn't rewrite it so much so that, you know, the majority of it can be considered, quote unquote, theirs. But, you know, so that's why they have the and in there. It's like this guy came in and really, you know, kind of run roughshod over all, <laughs> all the other guys' material, really. Yeah. I didn't know that uh, there was a difference there between the ampersand and the A&D. So now mm -hmm. I've got another nice piece of trivia in my yep. if you uh, have repertoire. The, if you have the ampersand, they did it together. But if you have A and D, like Marcus they did and McFeely have the ampersand. Precisely. It'd be great if they had the A and D, and the deal is Marcus was always writing scripts, and McFeely was constantly getting hired to fix them. <laughs> <laughs> Those two guys hate each other. <laughs> they just they got uh, opposite like uh, offices that are back to back, and their backs are against each wall. And every time you know the other one gets a script, bangs on the wall. What is this garbage you're feeding me? <laughs> And then I guess it's an even bigger rewrite when it goes to story by credit and then written by credit, right? Yeah, so that that kind of that just goes, eh, he kind of thought about something. He had like a generalized thought, but nobody really wrote it down on paper to the degree that we could call it a script. But uh, I do know that the the sort of tagline that Whedon added to it once he read the initial script was Avengers some assembly required. Oh, that sounds about right. And, well, yeah. and that's yeah, yeah. And that also sounds very Joss Whedon y too. I'm just like, isn't that a little winky wink to the camera? And that's sometimes some of the stuff I find annoying about Josh Sweden. Oh, no, I said something <laughs> negative about Josh Sweden. Don't come after yeah, yeah. me, Internet. I'm a Whedonite. I, I like the guy really well. I so do, too, I but I don't I don't have the hero praise that a lot of a lot of the, our nerd culture does. Everybody thinks he hung the moon and stars and we'll, we'll get to it. He hung the moon and stars and uh, Fox canceled them both after 11 episodes. <laughs> Oh, it's funny because it hurts, doesn't it, kids? Now, the, the cast, you mentioned the cast here, too, and I think that's another massive coup. You know, we were talking about this movie being a game changer, but for any kind of franchise movie, and in particular comic book franchise movies, I mean, Warner Brothers couldn't even keep the same Batman for four movies in a row, and they brought most of their uh, principal players mm -hmm. back for this. And the one change they made, I really liked. I know this might get me some hate mail, but I really uh, prefer Mark Ruffalo to Ed Norton as Bruce Banner. Oh, me too. I, I, I don't, but I, I don't mind him. I'll say that. I, I don't I don't mind him in the role at all. If they're gonna if they had to make a change, I'm pleased with what became of that. Uh, I'm just always gonna be a bigger Edward Norton fan, but that's just that's just from just a plain acting standpoint. But that's just me. But I, and, I, I uh, like what I, I I it's it's tough to see this role if Edward Norton was playing it. I'll say that because I think it would be very, very different too. So and I also, I, I mean, you know, there was a lot of uh, back and forth. It was initially kind of ugly, and then it got pleasant before the movie finally uh, made it to theaters. But there was a little bit between the studio and Ed Norton going back and forth. And I came away with the idea, and I don't know the guy. I've never, you know, I have no way to know where this impression came from. But I get the idea that an Ed Norton project is an Ed Norton project. You know what I mean? Like he, no. he's not necessarily a, a, a cog in the machine. Well, the big thing is, is that he wanted, and, and I'll talk about this because Josh had had some had some talks with him, so I, I know a little bit of the history here. Um, so Edward Norton, at the end of the day, now this is all from from what I hear from most most sources that I've read, really just wants the best project to be done, and so and and if it happens to be he's a bit of a jerk that way, so be it. You know, he rewrote uh, a bit of the Incredible Hulk to have better character moments in it and things of that nature. Uh, as far as Joss Whedon knew. He went to Edward Norton, showed him the script and everything. Every, everything, everybody was copacetic, man. It was it was gonna happen, and uh, it turned around. It, so his his being off the project and everything blindsided Whedon just as much as it did anyone else. 
So it, it's interesting how all that kind of went down. But I think that was ultimately the studio just going, hey, he gave us a little bit of problem over here. Let's make sure that we can nip that in the bud and find somebody that'll play along. Because as we've said for a lot of these Marvel movies and everything, is that they really want people that are going to kind of play ball. Because yeah. un unlike yeah. a lot of DC stuff, I think this is very much done by a proper committee, if you will. So it runs through all the right channels and stuff, and they want everybody that's going to play ball and all the pieces of, that, of this giant Marvel Universe puzzle will fit together properly. And if they don't, that's going to upset the apple cart, and they don't want to do that. And I think maybe, just maybe, you know, this is pre-Disney. This was uh, just throwing a, a dart in the dark, if you will, when they made the original Iron Man. And uh, Robert Downey Jr. was, you know, coming off a little bit of a personal skid there. And they cast him. It seemed like a safe decision. But then he soon grew to be such a big part that they didn't want to take the chance, I guess, of having other people that could almost make the same sort of demands that Robert Downey Jr. could at this point, too. You're probably not wrong there. And, you know, I, I kind of suspect that's why Whedon got the the rug pulled out from under him, sort of halfway through Age of Ultron. But that's the conspiracy theorist in me. No, but you're, I, I don't think you're incorrect in that uh, in in that uh, assumption. And uh, I even think that Favreau during Iron Man Two was given a little bit of a you, got, you better know who your daddy is talk, and that's why he didn't have any uh, directorial input after Iron Man Two. He just stuck around and you know was a producer and a performer, but uh, gave up the reins. But really, when you look at the at, at the whole of, of everything, we'll get back to the movie specifically, but I, I, I like this generalized talk of the universe, too, because I think this movie is really where, uh, you know, kind of the culmination of everything that they were doing came from and really just kind of set the precedent for what would rest become and where everyone else would also be trying to get to at any particular point. But I, I think one of like the reason like the time for me that really came about was with Ant Man. With Ant Man being able to be as good a movie as it was. Yeah, because yeah, because that had everything set up to fail. We we had a director that everybody loved got kicked off of it and we're like, Oh crud, man, what's gonna happen over here? Is the is is this well oiled machine do you know they've made a lot of great decisions so far? Is this a decision that need that needed to be made, or is this really gonna you know turn everything upside down? And it turned out gangbusters, man. So at this point, you know, in in the cycle, you, you do question a lot of things that they're doing. But at this point, I give them kind of the reins that I gave you know uh, 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 Raimi back in the day with Spider Man. I was just like, look, until he screws this up, let him do whatever the heck he wants. You know? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I get you, man. I get you. Um, a couple more things on casting, I guess. Uh, Emily Blunt was the first choice for Black Widow, and I just can't picture anybody but Scarlett Johansson now. I, and I don't know a ton of Emily Blunt's work. How do you guys feel it would have turned out with an Emily Blunt Black Widow? Let me take it from here. Mm. First of all, how dare you, Bruce? <laughs> Emily Blunt is amazing. I like Emily <laughs> Blunt would have actually been better in that role. Emily Blunt is... Um, uh, she's in two amazing, amazing movies that if you haven't seen them, stop the podcast, go watch them immediately. One is the day after tomorrow. No, not the day after tomorrow. What is the, <laughs> what is the, what is the movie with Tom Cruise? That's uh die, repeat, live, die, repeat. That's yeah, what it's technically. Tomorrow. Yeah. Edge of tomorrow. Live, edge die, repeat. Tomorrow. There's 15 Good different movies. movies. I agree. She's, the, she's the, she's the, she's the, the, the main female in that. And then she's also in looper another awesome, awesome sci-fi movie. Mm -hmm. Totally worth seeing just for Jogo's makeup. <laughs> I love, uh, I love that actress. I think she's incredible. She would be an amazing, uh, uh, Scar, uh, uh, Black Widow. An amazing Scarlett Johansson. I like that idea. Emily Blunt as Scarlett Johansson as Black Widow. <laughs> it's so what, my, 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 they offered her the role and she said, no, I think she was signed to the role, and then uh, something uh, came up. You know, you know, I never get the whole story here. Well, Some kind of conflict or something. Well, think about scheduling. it this way. Think about it this way too, though. She may have just saw it saw it as it was initially, which was a tiny little role in Iron Man Two. Well, yeah, yeah, I'm sure. So, that's, well, I, it was a multi picture deal, but yeah, I'm but, sure that's what she looked it, at. But it. then, but but again, at that point, you're just like, what's what's really going to happen with this for reals? But no, I I do like Emily Blunt a whole lot. I will say this though, um, I and hey, I wanted to prove me wrong because I, I do I do like her as an actress a whole bunch. But I think from a physical standpoint, just like it, it feels like Scarlett Johansson could probably handle herself a little bit more. That's just me. Okay, no, you have no idea what you're talking Maybe about. Maybe I right? don't. 
You you literally you, right now the movie that hey I thought Emily Blunt saying this that year is Lego Batman. <laughs> I Same thought Emily Blunt. I thought Emily Blunt was the person who sang that annoying song "Beautiful" that used to be on the radio. So I was way off. <laughs> Her voice is weird. She does have a voice like an angel, though. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Maybe she could be uh, Della Reese's role in the reboot of Touched by an Angel. <laughs> or, ma- or maybe she's the new Dazzler. Ooh, I like that. Is uh-huh. she? Is she? I have no idea. <laughs> oh, because somebody was uh, sort of quasi-cast as Dazzler, but I don't remember who it was. Maybe it was Taylor Swift. I don't no, know. No, they, they... How, did you, how did you just say that word? <laughs> Dazzler. I did not. I didn't want hey, to do it. I didn't want to do it. People less... that are fans of Dazzler and people that are fans of Dazzler. I... <laughs> I'm more of a fan of Dazzler. <laughs> yeah. Lest anybody call up and just be just write another email, and just go like Bruce is. Sa-. I just was like, I'm gonna let that one lie. <laughs> Dazzler. 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 Uh, I think we might have a new t-shirt. <laughs> Dazz, learned a couple A's in there. You tell me how that's spelled. We'll make that shirt, Bruce. Uh, and, and there was a moment when I was watching this movie, and I was so glad it was made at the time it was, and with the sort of style and technique and, and the buildup and the casting, because I just saw Captain America. I saw uh, Chris Evans, you know, walking uh, through some dark room and picking up his gear. And for a moment, I just thought if they'd made this like in the late eighties, early nineties, Kevin Costner would have been uh captain America. And this would have been awful. Like I Ugh. started having this, this like, uh, I broke out in sweats thinking of how awfully this would have been cast anywhere between like 88 and 92. It, it would have been the worst. You know how wizard used to do that. You know yeah. how wizard used to do that yep. thing where they would do stunt casting. Casting call. Oh, yep. Yeah. We should do we should do a bit for worst casting ideas. For I've already like done that. it for this movie, man, because I, I I started thinking about all the people that have been rumored, and then I looked at some in movie references, and I came up. Tom Cruise would have been Iron Man. Well, he was scheduled to be Iron Man at one point yep. way back in the day. And, so, not and impossible. something's telling me Kevin Costner and a million bucks worth of CGI hair would have been capped. <laughs> And then there's the point where uh, uh, Tony Stark refers to Thor as Point Break, and I just had an epiphany that Patrick Swayze would have been a great Thor back in the day. He could have done some some hip swiveling dancing while he swung that uh, hammer around. Rick Moranis as Bruce Banner and Arnold Schwarzenegger as the Hulk. Dustin Hoffman as Hawkeye, I'm just saying. <laughs> Meg Ryan would have been cast as Black Widow, and I would have hated it. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you got to have the right villain, so Judge Reinhold as Loki. And rerun from what's happening as as, <laughs> as Nick Fury. No, that would have been the Hoff. You, you got to stick with the Hoff. I still like rerun in there. That's just me. I'm, I'm a rerun fan. <laughs> I like all rerun could have been like Coulson. Rerun is Coulson. <laughs> yes, <laughs> with the or beret and everything. Gary Coleman, you know, that, that would have been good too. Uh, you can never have too much Gary Coleman. <laughs> what you talking? Will about, you sign Peter? my Will that. you sign my cards, please? They're vintage. <laughs> Yes, perfect. With Gary Coleman as Modoc, um, <laughs> it's gonna happen. It might, oh. it might happen with Dinklage. I mean, people are already talking about that, right? Oh man, I want him to be Puck. I think that's probably where it's more likely to go. If we're honest, though, he's already been in universe, so who knows? Well, no, that's that's their universe. That's the that's the Fox universe. That was the that, yeah, but uh, Puck. I don't know where Alpha Flight falls on on this whole ride still. I, would, I I weirdly know I weirdly know this answer. Alpha Flight is with X Men. Yeah, that's what I would that's have figured. I, hmm. So, uh, but but it's only the Canadian rights. So Fox <laughs> could only release it in Canada. No one else knows the about this movie. Rate right? on those rights, you're going to have a lot more rights in America. So, <laughs> oh man, and uh, they could film it at the same studio where they did that Power Pack uh, thing. <laughs> Coming after you, Canada. Um, so yeah, this is, you know, this is a movie that I feel like everybody's seen and everybody has their opinion about it. So I think I'm enjoying the behind the scenes and yeah. what if kind of game more than actually breaking down the movie. But I feel like I'm walking all over you guys. No, that's fine. Well, but- let me, let me, let, 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 let me ask you this question because how bad do you guys think this movie screwed up the DC universe? Oh my gosh. This is this, honestly, I, I sat back uh, and watched this and just go this. It, I mean, like I love the movie. But I go, this movie is now what is wrong with comic book movies. In, in like in a great in a, in the best of ways and in the worst of ways, right? Uh, well, I mean the 
the movie that was most obviously impacted by Marvel's plan was Green Lantern, but that's before this movie came out, but it's impacted because they were trying to do the same thing and trying too hard and they haven't really regained from it. But I'm also a believer in uh, what I eat won't make you fat. So what Warner Brothers has done wrong is on them, not, you know, if they allow themselves to be uh, shaken by this, that's not, uh, I, I don't want to give this movie the credit. Well, you're right. It's it's all on them, but at the same time, it's 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 covetous, man. That's all what it is. As they sit back well, they, and just go like, look at them just knocking it out of the park every time, and they don't want to be known as the also rans, right? Well, then they should follow the great American tradition of just uh, ponying up a whole bunch of money and buying off all the Marvel people. I mean, just like the comics do. If DC has a great writer, Marvel would hire him away for ten years, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Why don't they just do that the movie side? You know pony up and get kevin feige for like four movies then uh, D uh disney's gonna pony up even more and get him back you know that's it's the american way we stole all the uh best physicists in the world when we needed them why not uh directors and producers that's true have robert downey jr play batman Ooh, <laughs> I, he would be great he would do it it'd too. be a different interpretation but it'd, it'd be a lot like will arnett's i feel but here's the thing at the same time like all, all these people they, they see all that happen and, and they want to do that but I think not since the days of old school studio system and everything, people are just blood loyal to you know to to their company, man. Because uh, I I just don't think there is I forget who was, but there's a couple of people that have been asked about like, hey, what do you think about the DC stuff? And they I think Sam Jackson straight up just goes, yeah, they're all garbage. What we do is amazing. So I mean I, I think it, I think it creates a loyalty in these people that just kind of goes, hey, this is what we're going to do. And I think uh, of all those people, Robert Downey Jr. is probably one of the biggest because he just this is the role that got him back to where he is right now, and it's and it's absolutely unbelievable. Follow him on his Facebook page, kids. I don't think this guy wants to stop being Tony Stark anytime soon. I think he and loves this role more than life itself. And I'm going to go ahead and say this, and at this point, the mechanism has been built so that the Empire can continue without him, potentially. But you don't have that charismatic guy as Iron Man in movie one. I don't think we have what we have today for Marvel or, oh, or Disney not. Marvel movies. But you see him, But you see him in that like Infinity War little promo that they put out there, and he doesn't look a guy he doesn't look like a guy who's reluctantly on set. He doesn't look like a guy who's reluctantly on set in the uh, trailer for Spider-Man Homecoming. I mean, yeah. the guy loves what he's doing. I I, th I think he digs everything that he's doing. And, like, it's weird because it's, like, in a sense also, because it kind of, the character, in a way, you know, from a personality standpoint, is a lot like Robert Downey Jr. But that's also kind of become his own personality to, you know, dialing that to 11. He's almost become Tony Stark himself. So it's a real weird you know symbiotic relationship going on he also and, doesn't look like a guy that's been in jail for a year <laughs> yeah yeah and and i mean uh i'm just kind of giving you my uh, gestalt of the situation i don't have hard numbers but i feel like he came to iron man when he only had like maybe his last million in the bank and needed the paycheck and now he's like the richest guy in hollywood as far as actors are concerned so yeah. this is really uh it's like he has had uh, two lives, the before Iron Man life and the after Iron Man life. No, and I'm going to guess he likes the after better. Well, he is. When he was on Leno back in the day, uh, he asked him, he was just like, hey, man, so which do you like better? Doing like a movie where you get all the Academy Awards and stuff like that, all those nominations and everything, or a big giant blockbuster like this? He like paused for like half a second and goes, oh, the blockbuster. What, are you kidding me? This is great. <laughs> yeah. It's like he, and the guy's great. I mean, he, he uh, has kept up his end of the bargain. I'll say that. Yeah. Or at least hiding it very well. Yeah, if 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 he hates what he's doing now, he is de he needs an Oscar for these movies. <laughs> I was going to say to be loving hiding it. hiding it very well is kind of goes along with the job when you're uh, a performer, right? Yeah, but at the same oh, time no, no. too, I don't think he would have so much public persona stuff going on where it seems like he's just digging it. I mean, when the guy goes and shares Iron Man memes, you know he's you know he likes what he does. Yeah. The guy makes it a point to uh, get photographed in a comic shop at least once a year, too. I mean, mm. it's the sort of thing you have to set out to do. Yeah, they, they, they're not playing around. When's the last time Christian Bale got photographed at Midtown Comics? Oh, no, it never. <laughs> Christian Bale wouldn't set, set, set foot inside of that place. But back to your original question, how much did this damage... Uh, uh, Warner Brothers uh, DC properties I'm going to say that it only damaged it as much as they let it because they actually had finally hit on something really good and special in their own right 
You know, I'd put uh, the Dark Knight up against any superhero movie ever made. And then they saw this and uh, really changed their direction and then changed their direction again and then changed their direction again when I think they should have just uh, let some good movie makers uh, make the movies they wanted to make and not try so hard to be worried about the what the what kind of car the neighbors are driving but that's the thing i think it all comes from that and i think it i think it, fear stems from that quite a bit and i think that's why they're they're in the situation that they're in right now is they are scared to to look bad they are scared to drop the ball that's why Zack snyder is continuing to go back to this that's why ben affleck is scared to direct the batman movie because he just doesn't want to have to bear that responsibility and i say if warner brothers were smart they would look internally you know, instead of uh, worrying about what Disney's doing with Marvel, uh, look inside and see what was it that worked about uh, the Dark Knight trilogy that uh, uh, Nolan did. What worked well about uh, the Peter Jackson's uh, Lord of the Rings, not so much The Hobbit. Uh, what worked well about Harry Potter? I mean, they have their own movies that have just uh, taken in all the money available for a month at a time. So don't worry about, you know, that this summer belonged to uh, Disney. Let's go ahead and just do what we do. But they can't ever seem to do that. I think there's a company issue there. But I th- you're right. Yeah, it's, it seems to me that there's a lot of smart people doing a lot of stupid things around there, for sure. And and I also feel like it's the opposite in terms of casting, too, because Marvel, uh, like I said, I suspect that they didn't want uh, the name to be bigger than the role. Uh, a lot of times, you know, a lot of folks, are, you know, who the heck I'd never heard of Chris Hemsworth before he was Thor. Mm-hmm. Chris Evans was a smallish actor in terms of the roles he'd had. I mean, he was known, but he wasn't uh, what I would call a draw. Uh, but then at the other end of things, they're saying, OK, we're going to cast this. Who who are the the names of people that were really popular 15 years ago? OK, we're going to we got to get Will Smith no matter what we have to change to get it. Uh, we better get Ben Affleck, you know, no matter what it t- they're, they're after the name and not really looking to suit the character. I I would agree to that up until Affleck because I believe I well I think Affleck's great but I don't think that they cast him because he was great I honestly think it was uh, uh sort of the biggest I mean they wanted oh I, this is not something I'm making up as a joke their uh, top line for uh, Amanda Waller was Oprah Winfrey that is not what the studio should be doing to cast that role <laughs> <laughs> yeah. not wrong okay. can't fight that. But yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, unfortunately, uh, Monique has been blacklisted, so they wouldn't uh, hire her. But she would have been probably better than Oprah in that role. Hey, man, that's what happens when you win that Oscar, man. Sometimes you go down the tubes real fast. It happens to a ton of people, man. Just get Medea to play Waller. I, 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 I'd buy tickets to that. Oh, Lord, Lord, you're going to get up in here, Mr. <laughs> Batman. Medea's Suicide Medea Squad. Medea does the Justice League. Oh, <laughs> That's a totally different movie there. Sean. Listen, but here's the thing. You'd go to see that, wouldn't you? Boy, I would. <laughs> oh, yeah. You better believe it. They got my money lock, stock, and barrel right there, man. I don't even care. I'll just like, yes, please. Sign me up. Man, uh, <laughs> let's talk just, just simply about the movie because mm-hmm. let's point out some things we liked or don't like. There are going to be people annoyed that we haven't really broken down any of it. I don't think we need to hit it beat by beat, but watching it again recently here for this podcast, what were some of the things maybe you forgot how much you liked or things that you thought you liked better than you did? You guys have any ideas? I can tell you the main one for me, the thing that really popped out to me is just how well written Black Widow is in this first Avengers movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, she would have been written better with Emily Blunt, but you know, you got what you got. (laughs) Well, exactly. Emily Blunt, a far better, far superior actress. Anyway, the, um, the, the character is so well written and so realized and she literally, they, she went into this movie with nothing. I don't know about you guys, but I thought that she was going to be the weak point, Mm -hmm. not because she's a lady, but because she had nothing to do in Iron Man two. Yeah. And so going, going into this movie, I was like, ah, that's probably going to be pretty weak, but at least Scarlett Johansson's really pretty. And we get to look at her. Right. And and I kind of thought she was going to be the member who betrayed the team or double crossed the team. You know what I mean? That's kind of what you are set up to expect just from the character, uh, the nature of the character. Right, and it, it kind of makes sense that that would be what that. And the funny part is, is how like throughout all the movies, she's one of like the most loyal people in the entire group. But I know her interrogation scene in Russia. The first time I saw this movie, that was a real highlight of the movie, and it still holds up after you know at least twenty viewings. And the, you're right that that holds up well. And then it also, but the the great thing uh, you know that that Whedon does is that he goes through and everything is just a setup to something else. Because that's a setup, obviously, to the later scene with Loki and everything. 
And while not an obvious one, it is just like, hey, I'm doing what I'm doing in order to, you know, accomplish a goal here, even though I'm going to look like I'm losing most of the time. I think that's an important thing. And it's just, it's great that we planted that earlier and then just, you know, an hour and 20 later, pick it right back up. Well, I think you know, the scene, go ahead. I'm sorry, Sean. I was going to say it's, it's one of the things that Whedon does best where the three characters that you should care the least about because they've just been so poorly handled in this franchise, he completely flips around to where they're the best parts of the movie. And it's, it's black widow, Phil Coulson and, uh, and Hulk, Mm -hmm. you know, those three, those three characters were weak, weak, weak before we went into Avengers and now they are beloved. Well, I want to talk about Coulson here. Because for a long time, I thought that uh, Whedon was just being too much of a prima donna in his uh, complaints, I guess, about how Coulson was dealt with post-Avengers. But uh, this watching it, I really realized that that everything Whedon tried to do with Coulson was just undermined by the things that have followed it. How do you guys feel about True, that? Because I totally it, agree with you. Had zero impact. I totally devalued the character because of what's happened since. And and it, it really took a very Whedon-esque aspect of this movie away from him after the fact. You're right. and I, But I want to piggyback on that, is that that was such a Whedon-esque move that it almost seemed a little too on the nose. And I think that's what probably more that their, their reaction to was like, you know, this is, it's a bit much. I mean, I get why they did it. And I, I kind of understand why they did what they did post that, but... At the same time, it it I, I don't know. I, I'm of two minds about it. I, I thought it was quite quite the uh, you know cojones to actually you know go and kill him off and everything. But yeah, you know, especially a movie only creation. You know, when they bring back uh, uh, Bucky, you know, as the Winter Soldier, I can't complain too much because it's already happened. You know, mm. but the the way that they dealt with Coulson, uh, it just undermines this moment in the movie. Uh, and also the medical professional in me does think he went from not looking that bad off to completely dead awfully quick, like mid-sentence. Yeah. Because <laughs> still... I'll tell you this. I have uh, hit my pinky toe on the uh, door frame on more than one occasion and been in far more uh, visible pain than Coulson was after being speared by Loki's staff. He was stunned, man. You can't, you can't, you can't. Come on. He was stunned into like, oh, it just happened. I don't know. I don't know. And then that's Well, and I'll then tell you what. I would not have been giving any words of wisdom to Nick Fury after I stumped my little toe because that hurt like a you-know-what. And you and you know what? I don't even like you anymore. <laughs> I'm fine. What? Shut up. <laughs> Bald-headed one-eyed jerk. Yeah. Uh, no, but now I'll say one of the things that I that I was um, interested by this, this time going through is that the action up front uh, throughout the first, you know, honestly about three fourths of the movie is not very good. The action is just is shot very oh, very shabbily. That, that was a question I had for you guys. Is you know this movie received mostly praise. It was mostly well received, but because of its length. Some people did complain about the pacing, um, but but when you break it down, what's supposed to happen in the middle of a movie happened in the middle. It just seemed like it took longer to get there because the movie had a ridiculously long third act that I wouldn't give up a second of. Um, I rewatching, I don't have any trouble with the pacing. I don't have that much trouble with the action early on, but a lot of that is because I know what's on the way. Well, the th- pro- the problem is that I don't uh, is is not pacing. It's just the action itself. I think the action shot throughout with uh, you know, save for the last ha- uh, for the last final set piece and everything is very lackluster. Is very bland, and it really and I thought okay, and like my thought while we rewatching here was like. Uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe that's Joss's big problem. Was it's just like you know, maybe he's just not as good as directing action as we all kind of thought he might actually be. But that being said, when you get to the final piece, it's like, oh no, what happened was is clearly they spent all their time and effort, you know, putting together this last big piece, which I remember being a lot more disjointed and not so good. But this time going through and really watching it and being able to just kind of like purposely purposely dissecting it for the you know course of this review and everything 
Uh, it's done really well. It's the best directed part in this thing. And again, it's that Whedon keeping all the balls in the air at the same time and knowing where each of them is at the specific time. There's a great shot that kind of goes through and like you visit each member of the team in a one giant wide shot and everything that just kind of tracks along and follows everybody. That is spectacularly well done. And, uh, you know, if you went and see it in 3D, it looks fantastic in 3D. It's just like he really when it comes down to that bit, he really knows what he's doing. Where do you come down on this, Sean? I think that the movie is too long. Um, I still do. <clears throat> and and just just from the perspective of, let's say you are trying, and I, I, you know, I used to harp on this a lot more than I do now, but just from the perspective of someone who's trying to get a loved one into the into the the things that they're into, mm-hmm. like you know, like superhero movies. This is not going to be the first movie you take them to. Um, this is going to be, you know, hopefully the fifth movie that you take them to. <laughs> but the the it, trying to indoctrinate someone into your culture, a, a two and a half long a two and a half hour long movie is not the way to do it. And so, and and even with people who are just casual fans, two and a half hours is a very very long time to sit through a movie. Now for us. We love this movie, and and we should. This is the best of the best of what what they can do. However, if I am like my mom, my mom is going to be bored to tears at the second hour of this movie. Yeah, <laughs> and it doesn't matter the pacing. It doesn't matter how well it's shot. It's two hours. You know, it's it's literally the length of the movie, and that's that's why I feel like two and a half hours is a very long time for this movie. True, but and this if is a going reward. To trim it, I mean, if they are going to trim, going to trim it, trim it, trim it, and it's interesting, even just from 2012 to 2017, seeing the way they approach these movies differently, because they still approach this like somebody's going to come in and watch this and not have seen any of the previous movies. They do a lot of of exposition and explaining that's already been done. Whereas in 2017, they'll have a third string character from a movie like uh, Dr. Strange or Ant-Man just show up with no explanation and understand that we either know who he is or we don't, don't need to know that badly. But here, you know, even that they had like a preamble and a prologue, then the movie started. And that whole preamble about the Tesseract could easily, easily have just been cut. If that movie was being made now with the success they've had, I don't think they, feel they need to go a little bit out of their way to show us a bit of uh, Captain America's backstory like they did here. Mm -hmm. So I do think if they shortened it, it would be the front end and not the back end. I agree. That's that's probably very on point. Uh, One of the things I do want to complain about this movie, because there's there's so much that I love, but I do do have a couple nits to pick, uh, is this is the weakest costuming that we've seen. And uh, I'm really gonna harp on the hardest. Gonna be Captain America. Captain America's oh, costume I'm with is you. awful. I'm I'm arm in arm with you. I'm so glad when Winter Soldier came, they they dialed back his costume a little bit. Well, I don't even yeah. mind. I don't even mind the colors. I mean, I, the colors are fine with me. I mean, we we've seen him do it in two other Captain America movies where we've had some pretty decent colors. Loudness of colors, I don't care. I think it's the quality of the material that's there. It looks like crappy spandex covering some some like you know like like old the old pads and stuff that they had back in the day for like Keaton to wear in Batman, the, you know. The worst is the is the cowl. You know, the worst is the cowl that took the place of his helmet. That rubbery thing over his yeah. face is far and away the weakest part of any of the costuming in this movie. It just I don't have awful. a problem with uh with Thor's costuming. The Iron Man uh armor looks great the way it was rendered. The Hulk, the way he's rendered in this movie is still my favorite rendering of the Hulk ever and it blew my mind when I saw it. And uh, Loki is just perfect in his uh, armor. I do. I do wish we had a little more Loki. Uh, not not necessarily in this movie, but in subsequent movies. Hopefully, we'll get it with Ragnarok. Uh, in the big proper, you know, Loki helmet and everything. I just, yeah, with the horns on. Yeah, it. I like that. And I, w- I wish we had more of that kind of stuff in there. But yeah, I mean, Captain America is the big one. Uh, Thor is okay. I, it could be a little bit better. He, I, I think the s- surrounding movies, he's he looks better in those. Uh, but yeah, it's just. It's kind of a it's kind of weak sauce there, but man, that just it kills me because every other Captain America costume in every other movie looks boss. This just yep. looks bad, and I'm just like it I, just throws I, I me out of the movie. I don't know how it happened. Uh, there's even an end movie explanation though because they let Coulson help design it. Yeah, I, I wish that I wish I could buy that as much as they maybe want to sell it. 
<laughs> you know, I was just like, oh, okay, is that why it looks like crap? I think you could come up with a better looking costume, maybe, because he's going to be wearing it three fourths of a bloody movie. But what do you I, guys think about the Chitari? Here's I like the Chitari more this time than I remember initially liking it because that was one of the big things that was just like to me it was a very kind of nameless, faceless, and they're still kind of that. And the end of this movie initially did remind me more of a Transformers movie. Uh, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I've seen it enough times or it's kind of gone through my system and stuff, but it didn't scream that to me this time for some reason. I, I don't know why I liked it more this I, time. I mean, they're obviously orcs, you know, I mean, you know, they're the, the Marvel universe equivalent of orcs, but that works really well because you get to see, uh, the superheroes actually being superheroes. You get to see them actually pounding on people. And it's just because of the sheer number of. Uh, of enemies they have they face and volume is their enemy not the individuals which is more fun to me than uh, the more classic you know the villain uh, beats up the hero for 85 minutes than in the last uh, 15 minutes the hero beats the villain you know yeah yeah i agree I, it, I they're still nameless and faceless but it's with purpose and, and they had gets, Loki. They they had Loki as the face to put to it, but Loki never really has that much of an upper hand, and uh, that's kind of an interesting take for for a movie like this. And I like that. I think that's why I like Loki better than most of their villains. Agreed. The uh, um, and also I I I have to mention this. The best line in any superhero movie ever is in this movie, also, and I, I completely forgot about it till just now, which is Banner turns around to them and he says. You still haven't figured out my secret. I'm always angry. And he turns yeah. around and turns into the Hulk and saves the day. And it yeah. is the best line in superhero movies to me. It, it, it's not even close. It's my favorite yeah. thing. I'll tell you, I have never forgotten that line. My personal favorite uh, scenario, I guess you could call it scene in this movie, is when uh, Loki starts to make his monologue to Hulk and like, seven words into it hulk just grabs him and smashes him back and forth about 15 times and then says puny god that's my favorite i've i've seen a uh, a, a gif of uh, hulk just smashing loki and i've actually stared at it probably for an hour nonstop and giggled so there's something i love about that that you know anytime it, it's like when people watch uh, people complaining about other movie properties say batman v superman and they say if that fight really happened superman would just grab batman and smash him around 50 times but the movie can't do that because it's not interesting well guess what joss whedon did it and it was super interesting to me i loved it <laughs> and no one questioned anything it was just like and it was the perfect scenario it's like oh you've got this you've got this god and you've got and you've got the hulk he smashes him around and he's still breathing on the ground at the end of the thing and never once do you just go like oh well that's just out of like yeah, no it's kind of perfect well, his reaction, his reaction after getting pounded is so great. Oh, God. He's like wheezing. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is going to chew up every scene he's in and steal it. But uh, the Hulk, for me, was my favorite part of the movie. And Ruffalo. I liked Ruffalo a lot, too. Me too. Uh, but part of part of that's because I had not been happy with any way the Hulk had ever been dealt with before. And when I saw this movie, I was worried that he wouldn't be dealt with here. And finally, I had a Hulk movie that I could just 100 percent be behind. There was a lot of great joy behind it and stuff. And there were there were always there was like there's tiny little uh, little Easter eggs that they kind of put everywhere. I mean, there's a point where he says, you know, I, I, I tried to kill him. I put a bullet in my mouth and the big guy ate it, you know, essentially spit it back out. Yeah. 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 So and but that's I mean, and that's a scene in the deleted scenes in the uh, the Incredible Hulk and stuff. So, you know, it's it's nice little kind of nods like that that they'll kind of sprinkle in there just for fans and stuff. Yeah, absolutely, man. And then, of course, the the great moment where uh, Hulk and Thor finally land safely inside a skyscraper, and then just without warning and without any reaction shot, Hulk <laughs> fist pounds Thor in the head, and then next scene. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, and there were a lot of laughs to be had in this. And, you know, just from, you know, I bet you five bucks, like, oh, there's nothing that I could see that would surprise me. I'll bet you five bucks and him just handed him five bucks on the head. That was the big thing for me, man. That was something I remember when watching this the first time is they're, they're on the, uh, you know, the deck of the carrier and everything. And they're like, nope, this is not a submersible. And then it, I was just like, oh, my, they did it. They actually so did it. So five years ago, Adam, how many times did you make a joke? Man, that was one hell of carrier. <laughs> I'm I'm not as corny as you, Bruce, but maybe once. <laughs> <laughs> what am I, George Burns? <laughs> Something 
didn't make a... He was a legend, I tell you. Oh God, you devil too was a great one. <laughs> but it, you know, I look, I had a lot I had a lot of fun. And I gotta say, as much as I was kind of going, man, I, I don't know that this is gonna hold up as well as as well as it probably could should have. Um, yeah, it, it did a decent job. Now, before we get to uh, rating this bad boy and everything, we've got to let, ask, let oh, me give you whoa, whoa, one no. more little nitpick. How Adam. dare you? I'm sorry to derail you here. <laughs> no. Sorry to derail you. Do you have any thoughts on the 1.85 to one aspect ratio? Yeah, it's bad. Done. I knew I would get you on that one. No, trust but, me. Uh, it was filmed in 1.85 to 1. <laughs> trust me, like at the beginning of the movie, it did like, like even watching it this time, I was just like, ah, oh, you know, that's a darn inconsistency that I don't like, but okay, whatever, man. I mean, I'm not, I, what's done <laughs> is done, but no, I don't like it. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> I, I just had to get that. You're the, no. the only guy I know that talks a whole lot about aspect ratio. It bugs so me, I man. Had to say. If it ain't right, I don't like it. <laughs> I get upset. I had a I had a conversation about aspect ratio today where I just nodded my head and smiled like I knew what they were talking about. I'm over here. <laughs> I'm I and I'm the guy who buys the Criterion version of On the Waterfront because it has the three different versions in it that are that like people fight over which one is correct. <laughs> And then uh, just the last little tidbit, shawarma sales did go up after this movie was released. Indeed they did. And people across the pond there, when they got this movie before us, poor saps over there didn't get that scene. Boom! USA! 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 Serves serves them right for making us change the name over there. Yeah, no kidding. Eat it, Merrick! (laughs) (laughs) All right, now we can officially get down to the most important part of this thing, but, and that's not the, that's not our rating. You guys pretty much figure out what this is. We got to find out how this bad boy uh, connects to our good old friend Sylvester Stallone. Thanks, Adam. I have a prepared statement. Hmm. There's a lot of things I don't know. (laughs) I don't know why the TV show Two Broke Girls is so popular. I don't know anything about Swarovski crystals. I definitely didn't know that the same guy who wrote Inspector Gadget also was a co-writer on The Avengers. Hmm. How could that possibly be the same guy? Now, as a nerdy nerd, I'd heard the name Zach Penn because he wrote X-Men 2 and The Incredible Hulk. But he also wrote Elektra and X-Men 3 and the vastly overrated 90s comedy PCU. Zach Penn started his career when he wrote and sold his first script at age 23. That script was called The Last Action Hero. Mm-hmm. And if you like that movie, you're wrong. Because that movie is awful and you have bad taste. <laughs> Zach Penn is also a director and producer, but his greatest accomplishment came in 1998 when he worked as a story consultant on Ants, a movie which has only come up once before on this show during episode 42, which was our episode on The Incredibles, which is a way better animated movie. Bruce taught uh, all of us so many things I don't even I didn't even know about The Incredibles and about Pixar. And if you haven't listened to that episode yet, you should, totally should, just for Bruce's insight alone. Adam, you said some pretty important things too, but I just can't recall anything you said. <laughs> but to get back to it, Zach Penn did some work on Ants, which stars the voice talent of Woody Allen and Ferrari enthusiast Sylvester Stallone. Something not everyone knows is that Woody Allen and Stallone have worked together before in another movie, Bananas, in 1971. That makes these two men very, very old. And there you have it, Agent Piers, this week's Stallone connection. Now, Harry Dean Stanton and Ashley Johnson, let's review this movie so we can all get ready to be disappointed by Logan next week. Yeah, indeed. Hey, now. Hey, now. <laughs> all right. So here on Here Movie Podcast, we don't have uh, letters. We don't have you know grades or stars or any of that nonsense. We have our own nonsense. It's called the Patented Robin Rating System. If you'd like to check out what that looks like, head on down to Facebook.com slash Hero Movie Podcast and look at it there, man. It's at the top. And hey, while you're there, throw us a like. We're almost up to 2,000 likes over there, so we really appreciate that. Hello! Bruce, where does The Avengers fall on the HMP Robin rating system for you, sir? This is not my favorite superhero movie of all time, but it is my favorite Marvel movie ever. There's no way this could be anything other than a Dick Grayson. Uh, when I watch a movie and I'm trying to decide, is this a Tim Drake or a Dick Grayson, I say, did I like this Close to as good as Avengers. I mean, this is my measuring stick for uh, Dick Grayson uh, rating. So what else could it be? You know, Dick Grayson. Very good. Mr. Keenan. This is a Dick Grayson all day, son. All day, son. I love this movie. Um, It has changed everything about comic book movies. If your movie is not fun and enjoyable, 
uh, you'd better have a damn good movie. Um, this this is the the hallmark. This is the benchmark. It's a dick racing all day. All right, on to me. So uh, before I started this bad boy up, I, I thought for sure I was just like, well, I don't know if I can go Dick Grayson. I think this is going to be, you know, just right underneath that. Not by a lot, but by a little bit. And as, as it went on, I was just like, oh, there's a little nit. There's a little nit. But, man, I tell you what, by the end of this thing, you can't deny the smile on your face, man. It just does exactly what it's supposed to do. There are so many times in this that even the little tiny things that you're just like, oh, that's not so good. Man, does it have 15 different things to just go right against that to just go like, nah, 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 bro. This is really good. And so, yeah, this is it's Dick Grayson all day long, man. I, I just, as much as I wanted to try to give a little jab to it, uh, e- even the short fallings aren't enough for me to, you know, go away from giving this top honors, man. So... Dick Grayson's all around. All right. And there was never a doubt for me. Yeah. Well, not from you because you're a sycophant and we know that. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Okay. So next week we start off the summer. uh, I call this, even though it's March, (laughs) it's summer starts earlier every single year, kids. And uh, this year is no different. We're starting off big time here with the last entrance into the Wolverine uh, franchise here. The last Hugh Jackman is Wolverine. The last uh, you know, uh, our our last viewing of Professor X, man. Maybe not Professor yeah. X seriously, but you know, Patrick Stewart is Professor X. Patrick Stewart, you know, sh- sailing off into the sunset, and he says he's glad to because he believes Logan is just that darn good. We're gonna find out next week if indeed Logan is so darn good as I'm sure most of you are. So uh, hit us back up here next week where we review Logan as well. Until that time, Bruce, where can we find more of your work on the internet, sir? Just a reminder to everybody, Dragon in the Needles is out there. There's uh, the audio book, but there's also the uh, e-book, the i-book, the audio book, the paperback. Uh, you can find almost all of that at Amazon. Uh, iTunes has the i-book and the audio book as well, but Amazon has it all. It's one stop. Just go to Amazon, search for Dragon in the Needles, and uh, you can check out Chubby Wizard where uh, you know we're talking about comic books and TV, and we get to run down the Gorilla City episode of Flash and uh, go on over to Heroes and Villains. My next episode should be about Black Bolt whenever it comes out. Very nice. Will Black Bolt have a lot to say about the show? Huh? Huh? I, I hate myself too. <laughs> hey. Don't worry. <laughs> Stan, Stan Lee at his drunkest when he came up with the name Black Agar Boltagon. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what we're going to do. <laughs> what do you think about that? You're drunk again, aren't you? You shut up. And of course, uh, uh, Sean, what do you got, buddy? I would, I would say to you, Bruce, that that's probably one of his best ideas that he came up with by himself. <laughs> <laughs> Same. The man's yeah. almost about on his deathbed. How dare you? <laughs> I know, and he's a treasure, and I'm and I'm trying to, to <laughs> pick on the old man. Uh, you can reach me at Twitter at Hero Movie Sean. And of course, my other podcast, Hero Movie Podcast, uh, Hero Movie Podcast. I'm I'm used to plugging eight <laughs> different shows, so I'm all like, which one am I doing? Which one am I on right now that I've been doing for the past hour? Uh, the Film Find, thefilmfind.com. Uh, we got some new releases coming up and everything, so got all that on the docket there for you as well. Uh, of course, Preacher Podcast also, and my new daily show, Nerd Talk, now available on iTunes, Stitcher, and if you'd like to watch the live show, we do that Sunday through Thursday as well at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, uh, you know, hang out, man. We have a chat room open, so you can be part of the show. Executive producer uh, Jim Beverly called in on the last show and everything, man. So uh, we get some, nice. we, we get a lot of fun stuff going on and uh, all that kind of good stuff. So check that out as well, facebook.com slash nerdtalknow. That is it, everybody. Join us next week when we talk about Logan for Bruce Leslie, Sean Keenan. I'm Adam Portress. Stay super, everybody. Bye, Marty and Evie.